Hello, and uh, thanks everyone for joining us for today's installment of the Arts and Humanities Forum public webinar series, Humanity and Health, uh, which makes space for both scholars and the public to reflect on the human cost of health issues such as the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, I am Assistant Professor Peter Sapelsa from the newly renamed Department of the History of Science, Technology, and Medicine here at OU, and I'm very pleased to moderate this event and to introduce our speaker for today, Dr. Sarah Tracy. Uh, before I do that, I need to acknowledge our co-sponsors who include the Office of the Vice President for Research and Partnerships, the College of Arts and Sciences, uh, the Hudson College of Public Health, the Office of the Vice President for Research up at OU Health Sciences. Um, and our guest speaker, Dr. Tracy, is Edith Kinney Gaylord, Presidential Professor and Associate Professor of the History of Medicine and of Food Studies in the Honors College and also director of the Medical Humanities Program here at OU. Her research areas include histories of medicine and public health, histories of alcohol and drug use, food studies, and most recently, biography. She holds a PhD from the prestigious History and Sociology of Science Program at University of Pennsylvania, and is the author of the 2007 book, Alcoholism in America from Reconstruction to Prohibition, published by Johns Hopkins University Press. Her talk today, is entitled The Heart of the Matter, American Cardiology and Cold War Diplomacy, 1855 to 65, which comes from her current book project, a biography of the globe-trotting American physiologist, cookbook author, and health revolutionary, Ansel Keys. Um, so this talk puts Keys' work in cardiology in the context of international Cold War diplomacy. So thanks very much for being with us, and I'll turn it over to you, Dr. Tracy. Okay. Thank you so much, Pete. Uh, it's really great to be with you and everyone else uh, for today's Humanity and Health Seminar. And uh, as I was saying to you earlier, uh, this is National Public Health Week, right? So it seems uh, uh, well time to be talking about Ansel Keys. Um, I wanna thank uh, the Humanity and Health Seminar Director, Janet Ward, and my thanks also to Connor Neal, who's helped with and will be helping uh, with today's Zoom uh, uh, facility. Um, so let me give you a little bit of background for my talk this afternoon. And Connor, if you could queue up the slides, that would be, that would be great. Um, what I'm presenting, as Pete uh, referred uh, to, is part of a larger biographical uh, project about uh, Ansel, Ansel Keys. And there we go. Uh, perfect. Thank you. Uh, and I apologize for the crowded nature of this slide, but Keyes lived 100 years and he packed a lot into, into his century. Um, uh, Keyes was a, an oceanographer turned physiologist turned epidemiologist. And his life, as you can see, extends across the whole of the 20th century. Um, I'd, I'd like to say um, you know, with all of his contributions to the life and biomedical so sciences, that he's really a contender for uh, the title most important biomedical scientist no one's ever heard of. Um, that wouldn't have been the case in the Cold War, but, but very few people have heard of him today. Um, if you have heard of him, it's probably in relationship to the diet heart hypothesis that diets rich in saturated fat cause heart disease. Um, he was one of uh, the diet heart hypothesis uh, earliest and loudest advocates beginning in the 1950s. Um, and uh, you, if you didn't hear from him, uh, hear about him through that, you might have heard about him through uh, his work on the health benefits of the vegetable, fruit, and olive oil forward Mediterranean diet. Uh, Keyes was among the first to promote the Mediterranean diet to improve heart health. And he popularized his views by writing cookbooks, um, best-selling cookbooks, both internationally and nationally. Um, he wrote these with his wife, Margaret, a biochemist. Now, I'm using Keyes' long life to tell a range of stories uh, about the development of the life and biomedical sciences and their intersection with politics across the 20th century. Most of Keyes's uh, career took place during the Cold War. And that's the period between 1946 and 1991 when world politics and just about everything else was influenced greatly by the tense relationship uh, between the US and Soviet Union. 
uh, and the potential threat of nuclear annihilation. The story I'm going to share with you has to do with some of Keyes' activities at the height of the Cold War, 1955 to 65. And this was a time when his views on diet and heart health uh, really achieved great national and international popularity, in large part uh, through his alliance with the cardiologist Paul Dudley White. White was a well-known Boston cardiologist. He was on the faculty at Harvard, big champion of exercise. He was a cyclist. Um, and he was thrust onto the national and international stages when he was summoned to the bedside of Dwight Eisenhower uh, when Eisenhower had his heart attack in 1955. White routinely invoked Keyes in his bulletins about Eisenhower's condition. Uh, the New York Times article that you see uh, before you is no exception. Um, he mentions Keyes several times in it. And uh, for his part, Keyes used whites and the US government's interest in furthering East-West relations to his advantage as he pursued his own global program for heart disease epidemiology. So um, why is this story interesting and, and important? Well, um, it presents a new variety of soft power diplomacy during the Cold War, heart disease diplomacy. Um, so in, in essence, it broadens our understanding of the medical profession's role in Cold War diplomacy, moving beyond the vaccine diplomacy, that is the polio vaccine diplomacy. Uh, and you see here uh, Albert uh, Sabin with uh, Mikhail uh, Chumakov and his wife, also a virologist, uh, talking about uh, the pursuing of uh, uh, oral polio vaccine. Um, so it's not just polio, it's not just infectious disease, but also chronic disease that played a role in Cold War diplomacy. Um, and uh, if we look at cardiology in the Cold War, uh, we can also see the uh, dynamic relationships at the local, the national, and the global levels, and how local doctors in a variety of foreign countries uh, were empowered through training in cardiology. Um, and at the same time, uh, this training involved Ansel Keys and Keys's methods to pursue global heart disease epidemiology. So his way of doing things becomes the standard for a large part of the world. And um, I, I think this is a case of American medical imperialism in an area, in an era of geopolitical decolonization. And this is part of my interest in how Keyes gains influence both nationally and internationally. Also, um, the case of cardiology um, reminds us uh, that uh, there's more to Cold War diplomacy and science uh, than the space race, the green revolution, and big science. Most of the work I am going to be telling you about today uh, was funded through NGOs, such as the International Society of Cardiology and the American Heart Association, sometimes the World Health Organization. Um, and the work that uh, Paul Dudley White and Ansel Keys pursue uh, help to, uh, it, 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 it led to more permanent exchange programs, in particular the Lacey Zerubin Agreement in 1958 for cultural, educational, and medical exchanges between the US and, and Soviet Union. Um, so uh, I also, full disclosure, I'm about to write the chapter on the seven countries study. And so understanding more about this and how it fits within uh, the literature on the Cold War um, is, is on my mind right now. And so I really welcome any of your suggestions about how I might uh, improve this or um, develop this in the future. So, um, Let's start uh, with the, the formal presentation. In the summer of 1946, Albert Einstein, as chairman of the Emergency Committee of Atomic Scientists, was interviewed by Michael Amrine, a reporter for the New York Times. Contemplating the dangers of the new post-atomic world, Einstein observed, the real problem is in the hearts of men. 
Now, these were words that any American cardiologist of the day would have agreed with quite literally. Uh, in 1946, uh, at the start of the Cold War, heart disease was the leading cause of mortality for Americans, followed by cancer and stroke. And it was a top cause of death uh, across the industrialized world. Um, it still is today. Um, and it's also a leading cause of death uh, in much of the developing world uh, as well. Einstein, of course, was not talking about diseases of the heart. Instead, he referred to the need to teach the public about the looming threat of nuclear war and uh, to foster a desire for international peace and goodwill at home and abroad. Uh, today, <clears throat> the physicist added, we must abandon competition and secure cooperation. So today, my talk is about uh, two mid-century medical figures, Paul Dudley White and Ansel Keys. Um, both men worked uh, tirelessly to secure Einstein's vision of global peace and goodwill among nations in the 50s and 60s, but through the vehicle of cardiovascular research. Their efforts were at the center of a larger health for peace movement within American medicine and public health. Uh, that took shape during the Eisenhower and Kennedy administrations. You might say that Keyes and White orchestrated a cardiology for peace um, campaign. And this involved the creation of international societies, uh, the development of world congresses, uh, the, <clears throat> uh, the uh, conducting of uh, cardiovascular epidemiology across the globe, Keyes' seven countries study, um, exchange programs, uh, testifying before Congress in favor of a new NIH division that would support international medical research, and also the creation of 10-day uh, seminars uh, to train cardiovascular researchers. Their campaign, the campaign of Keyes and White, um, was also privately funded, as I mentioned earlier, and it enlisted health professionals from around the world to investigate diseases of the heart, to promote heart health, and to advance global goodwill and peace among Eastern and Western Bloc nations. As private citizens, Keyes and White emphasized a people-to-people -people or scientist-to-scientist -scientist dialogue um, across the so-called Iron Curtain. They may have failed to bring about world peace, but Keyes and White were successful in building a global community of cardiologists who were interested in epidemiological research. In fact, they were actually creating, um, uh, creating this field of heart disease epidemiology on an international scale. Uh, disease, they like to say, knows no national boundaries. And today in the middle of the coronavirus pandemic, this is certainly a message that rings familiar. Through epidemiology, which I am defining very broadly as uh, the study of health and disease within and across populations, not individuals, but populations, Keyes and White helped usher in a new era of transnational biomedical research in the 1950s and 60s. At the same time, they did much to win the allegiance of their foreign colleagues and study participants. Um, thus, their self-defined overseas mission was twofold. First, to determine the causes of heart disease uh, through cross-national, cross-cultural population comparisons. And second, uh, to build a global community of medical specialists who would foster world health and world peace as they waged battle against their mutual foe of heart disease. Testifying before Congress in 1959 um, uh, in support of a health for peace program um, that would uh, uh, create a new branch of the NIH to support international medical research White articulated these goals. If only the physicians and medical research workers of the world could be more closely knit together in friendly relationship and in fruitful research in particular, their influence on international health and happiness could be profound. 
with at least a strong possibility that a contribution toward worldwide peace could be a vital byproduct. So let me tell you a little bit about Keys and White. Um, I'm going to present them to you and then uh, a snapshot of their collaborative efforts that mostly will focus on the seven countries study, uh, which was the first epidemiological study to systematically examine the relations among lifestyle, diet, and rates of heart attack and stroke in contrasting populations. Um, to coordinate this kind of study, uh, to coordinate a seven nation study, and the nations again were Finland, Italy, Greece, Japan, the Netherlands, the US, and Yugoslavia, to coordinate a seven nation study on three continents and include one communist country was no small undertaking in the 1950s, before the internet, before jet travel was common or affordable, and before cardiovascular epidemiology even existed as a public health field. Keyes used every resource at his disposal, including White's international popularity and including the Cold War rhetoric of science and disease as taking no political sides. And I hope to illustrate in this talk just how these two heart specialists interwove their scientific and their diplomatic goals uh, during the Cold War. First, Ansel Keys. Trained in biological oceanography, he received one of the first, well, he received the first PhD ever awarded uh, at Scripps Institution for in Oceanography in La Jolla, California. Um, he then went on to study physiology, uh, the physiology of fish and eels with Nobel Prize winning <clears throat> physiologist August Krogh in Copenhagen. Um, with Joseph Barcroft, a respiratory physiologist in Cambridge University. Um, and uh, he, he did great work there that at least his, his mentors admired. But in the middle of the depression, Keyes was really striking out in finding an academic post in comparative physiology. So he skipped species. Um, he decided to retrain as a human biologist at the Harvard Fatigue Lab. Uh, following his return from Europe in 1933. And from there, from the Harvard Fatigue Lab, Keyes went to the Mayo Clinic in 1936, uh, 1936 and moved on to a tenured post at the University of Minnesota in 1937. And there he worked until his retirement until in 1972. Now, by 1946, Keyes had made significant contributions to high altitude physiology and here you see a popular article that he wrote for Scientific Monthly based on his high altitude expedition. Um, he made contributions to military nutrition. Here you see the K ration. Well, oops, not yet. There we go. Uh, here's the K ration, which he developed. The K is for keys. Um, uh, the first meal ready to eat in 1941, he developed this for the US military. And he also made contributions uh, by 1946 to the biology and psychology of human starvation and rehabilitation. This was the Minnesota starvation experiment. And uh, Keyes helped guide post-war refeeding efforts in Europe that based on this study of starvation and rehabilitation among conscientious objector volunteers. In 1952, Keyes was understandably ready for a break. Um, he left uh, Minnesota to take a sabbatical year at the University of Oxford. And at about the same time, he became chair of the United Nations Joint Committee on Nutrition. The committee was a collaborative effort of the Food and Agriculture Organization and the World Health Organization. And my point here, um, and I'm sorry, this is work that's based on the starvation study um, uh, that he did for the UN Committee on Nutrition. But the point here is that this is when Keyes began to seriously examine what people around the world were eating or not eating. Um, uh, it was working as a consultant for the UN that Keyes also made a significant number of foreign contacts and learned which nations kept reliable data on the health of their populations. Already concerned about heart disease as the leading cause of death in the US, Keyes became intrigued by the comments of an Italian colleague he met 
at a UN Nutrition Committee meeting in early 1952. Uh, Neapolitan uh, health commissioner claimed that there was very little heart disease, no heart disease at his hospital in Naples. And he thought that this might have something to do with the diet of most Neapolitans, uh, which was low in meat and dairy fat and high in vegetables and olive oil. Keyes, who was tired of the cold, drizzly Oxford winter, uh, abandoned England in March of 1952 to see if the physician from Naples was correct about the low numbers of coronary patients. And it turned out that he was correct, but only with regard to the working or laboring classes who also enjoyed low cholesterol levels, it turned out, and ate a mostly vegetarian diet. Those with more wealth, uh, ate diets that more resembled those of Americans. And that is, they were rich in meat, dairy, and sweets. And guess what? Heart attacks were more common and blood cholesterol uh, levels were higher in this population of more affluent people. Keyes' desire to compare dietary patterns with the incidence of heart disease across nations began in 1952 with these observations in Naples. Now, no one was better suited or situated to help Keyes meet foreign cardiologists and heart researchers than Paul White. A Harvard College and medical school graduate, White had also studied extensively in London with British cardiologist and electrophysiologist Thomas Lewis. Now, Thomas Lewis was the first to apply the electrocardiograph to clinical settings, and White had also served in the British and American expeditionary forces in World War I France. He enjoyed working with European medical professionals in 1926. Uh, he even brought Soviet electrocardiographer Alexander Samoloff to Harvard Medical School. And in this uh, picture, you see a white on the right uh, seated with Samoloff. Uh, as early as 1926, he was reaching out to the Soviet Union. Taking a strong interest in diseases of the heart, White helped found the American Heart Association. In 1924, he became its president in 1941. And in between, he wrote a classic text in cardiology, heart disease. In 1948, White became the chief consultant to the National Heart Institute, a division of the NIH. And uh, you see here, uh, him working with the Ad National Advisory Heart Council in 1948. Um, he also worked extensively as a medical missionary for the Unitarian Service Committee, and through his work for the Unitarians, he developed ties to physicians throughout the world. White was an obvious resource for Keyes and Keyes' plan uh, to conduct a long-term transnational study of different populations, their respective diets, and lifestyles and the incipient risk of heart disease. Both men, both Keyes and White, had a global focus and White lent credibility and visibility to any medical endeavor. Uh, Keyes had a strong reputation at this point in nutritional physiology, but he was just beginning to study heart disease. So White was very valuable to him. In the late 1950s, in fact, no one had attempted a global study of the magnitude that Ansel Keys envisioned. Keys saw the world as his laboratory and nations with contrasting modes of living, different eating patterns and varying levels of heart disease were Keyes' natural experiments. Through, na through transnational comparisons, Keyes was trying to pinpoint the preventable causes of heart attack which honestly, until the mid 20th century was simply seen as an inevitable consequence of aging. Keyes and White both thought other nations had a lot to teach Americans about their health. And here I'll simply observe that as you can see in this 1953 uh, image uh, in the newspaper in the Minneapolis Sunday Tribune, um, they pointed to Japan and Italy Having, as having the heart healthiest diets. Um, and these were the former enemies of the United States. Um, they had a lot to teach us. To execute Keyes' plan for the seven countries study, it was necessary to assemble an international team of scientists with extensive local connections in their native countries. 
These individuals would travel to Yugoslavia, Italy, Greece, the Netherlands, Finland, Japan, the US uh, to take physical exams, conduct dietary surveys, uh, and take randomized samples of daily foods. Consumed by pop the daily foods that were consumed by populations of men from 18 largely rural areas in seven different countries. Pilot or feasibility studies began in 1953, and the study was put in place in 19, between 1958 and 1960, with data collected every five years thereafter from 13,000 study participants. This was a mammoth undertaking uh, in the mid 20th century, um, especially without US government funding. And remarkably, the seven countries study continues to this day with just a handful of surviving Greek villagers who are now in their 90s and, and early hundreds. And this, this work, um, uh, the seven countries study has probably done as much as any cardiovascular disease study um, with the possible exception of the Framingham Heart Study to direct attention to the causes of popular population rates of heart disease. The seven countries study demonstrated how dietary saturated fats and blood cholesterol levels can be used to predict heart disease prevalence within populations. So person to person interactions among the international researchers and between researchers and participants proved vital to the success of the seven countries study. Indeed, one of the striking features of both the seven countries and its pilot studies was the degree to which an international mix of cardiologists and nutritional scientists helped run the field surveys in each of the nations. In, the photo, in, in this photo, you see um, cardiologist uh, Noburu uh, Kimura from, uh, from Japan uh, and from the Japanese arm of the seven countries study, and he's examining a Dalmatian a uh, study participant um, as local seven countries physician Ratko Butsina to his left with his arm over his chest um, uh, uh, looks on. And in, in the next photo, um, uh, this is a pilot study done in the southern Italian town of uh, Nicotera uh, and Japanese physician Noboru Kimura uh, confers with Italian internist Alphonse Del Vecchio uh, with white on the left and with, sorry, with keys on the left and white on the right. This kind of international cooperation was essential uh, to ensure that standardized methods were applied in each of the studies populations. If they were gonna compare nations, they had to have standardized techniques. Um, but as uh, Keyes' successor, uh, at the Laboratory of Physiological Hygiene, Henry Blackburn has described, there was also great camaraderie that existed among the researchers who traveled with one another from village to village in these rural areas, sometimes by car when the roads were good enough, sometimes by mule, uh, sometimes on foot, carrying all this equipment with them. Likewise, Paul Dudley White um, made every effort to help Keyes recruit subjects for the seven countries. And White often gave brief speeches to local groups to draw in participants. Uh, this was the case, for example, at the Rotary Club in Naples, where having discussed the international scourge of heart disease and the high rates of heart attack in the US and in Sweden, White appealed to the Rotarians for their help um, and uh, he, he wanted a, a group essentially of affluent Rotarians and uh, he needed them to round out the study participant group. Uh, and he, he appealed to the upper level of Neapolitans like yourselves, doctors, lawyers, officials, businessmen, who in contrast to other groups have a good deal of coronary disease. It's nothing like trying to frighten your, uh, your audience into participating in your uh, study. That's what White kind of did in this case. Um, the Rotarians though, they complied. Uh, they flooded the clinic with calls to schedule their tests. Partic participation levels were much the same in uh, a very different area, Tito's Yugoslavia, um, the first country where field surveys of diet and lifestyle were conducted in 1958. 
And there uh, in Yugoslavia, about 95 to 98 percent of townspeople who were eligible uh, to participate in the study along the Dalmatian coast and within the eastern plains of Slavonia, they participated. Um, moreover, many of the townspeople, uh, mostly fishermen and farmers, invited the researchers into their own homes for dinner. They prepared local fare from the seas, from the fields, and provided uh, uh, the multinational teams of physicians with firsthand knowledge of uh, Slavic dining and hospitality. Um, you might say this was an example of uh, dinner table diplomacy. And uh, there you can see a group in Greece in the bottom right and uh, a man with his uh, um, water buffalo, I think, uh, on the left from Dalmatia. Um, the seven country study was but one of Keyes' and White's projects to promote transnational diplomacy. Earlier, I mentioned their government sanctioned but private exchanges between the US and USSR in 1956 and 57. Now, these were supported by the International Society of Cardiology, an organization that White had founded in 1946 to promote global research and training in heart disease prevention and care. As White notes in the Boston Globe article on the left, since we were an unofficial group, we expect to arrange the, for the expenses of the Russians ourselves. So he used private monies to support these exchanges. Um, and these informal exchanges with the Soviet Union received a lot of press. And together with the polio vaccine diplomacy um, that Peter Hotez has talked about uh, so much recently, um, uh, these, uh, these sort of pushed forward the drive for collaborative works of, of peace um, and really put heart disease as well as vaccination uh, and other diseases on the map. In, in fact, in January 1958, in the State of the Union Address, Dwight Eisenhower called for joint works of peace and specifically singled out efforts to, quote, eradicate malaria and to combat diseases that are the con common enemy of all mortals, such as cancer and heart disease. This uh, culminated in the signing of the Lacey-Zerubin Agreement in 1958, which promoted cultural, educational, and scientific exchanges. And as you can see from this next slide, um, the first 10 years of the Lacey-Zerubin agreement were very profitable for um, public health workers. All those black dots that you can see on your screen um, are places that uh, individuals from the US traveled uh, within the USSR. Um, they were also uh, extremely active uh, for the Soviet uh, delegations that visited the United States. Um, and in the next slide, uh, you can see that even Bartlesville, Oklahoma uh, was visited by um, uh, Soviet delegations in public health. Um, I don't know what they were doing, but we have a connection to this earlier cardiovascular disease um, uh, era. Uh, in 1966, White made Ansel Keys the director of the Scientific Council on Epidemiology and Prevention for the International Society of Cardiology, which he'd helped found, and a small grant program sponsored by the ISC strengthened Keyes' efforts to bring researchers from around the globe to the US to, to train in cardiovascular disease epidemiology in Minnesota. Italian, Japanese, Spanish, Yugoslavian physicians and physiologists all took up residence over a period of years at Keyes' Laboratory of Physiological Hygiene. And there they learned to use electrocardiographs and to interpret electrocardiograms according to the Minnesota Code. As they equipped themselves to pursue heart disease research back in their native countries, um, these medical scientists also bolstered the reputation of Keyes abroad and extended the medical, technical, and political reach of the US. And the International Society of Cardiology also sponsored um, World Congresses of Cardiology, um, which was another effort to create an international community of cardiologists 
The 1954 Congress was held in Washington, D.C. with two uh, Russian physicians attending. They were the first Soviet physicians to come to the U.S. since the Soviet Union had withdrawn from the World Health Organization in 1950. These week-long meetings, the International uh, World Congresses, um, were usually followed by visits to local hospitals, research facilities, and tourist attractions in the host country. And in 1962, more than 4,000 people, cardiologists, attended the Fourth World Congress of Cardiology in Mexico City, which you see here. Um, the high attendance uh, was largely because famed Mexican cardiologist uh, Ignacio Chavez was presiding at the World Congress. And Chavez was one of the co-founders, along with white and French cardiologist Charles Lubri, uh, of the International Society of Cardiology. As one British attendee observed, the Congresses were not where when one went to hear cutting edge research, but where you went to make connections. Um, the great value of such gatherings of cardiologists from so many different countries, this is his, uh, these are his words, um, uh, of the Britain's words, uh, the great value is that old acquaintances are renewed, new friends are made, and countless opportunities arise to discuss problems of mutual interest with colleagues from other lands. Those who attend cannot fail to be impressed by the great sense of international goodwill that develops as the week progresses. Out of the discussions at the 1962 and 66 World Congresses, a plan arose to uh, train people in the new field of international heart disease epidemiology. Recall that I told you Keyes and his associates were basically inventing the field in the 1950s. Um, tellingly, even the director of the famous Framingham Heart Study, which started in 1948 um, and was sponsored by the NIH, um, referred to himself as a little e epidemiologist. And this was to distinguish himself and other cardiologists and physiologists working um, in the field uh, from trained professional epidemiologists who were mostly studying infectious disease. The first international 10-day training seminar was held in 1968 in Makarska, Yugoslavia. It was initiated by Keyes and Chicago cardiologist Jeremiah Stamler, whom you see in the upper photograph uh, on the left, there's Stamler, and on the right, Keyes. The program was sponsored by the International Society of Cardiology, the World Health Organization, and the American Heart Association. Now in its 53rd year, the International 10-Day Training Seminar has um, uh, given thousands of people around the globe training in heart disease epidemiology. It's one of the lasting legacies of the Keys and Stamler and White efforts, this efforts in outreach and diplomacy. So um, to conclude, um, Paul Dudley White and Ansel Keys were not the only heart disease specialists with world peace on their minds. If we fast forward a bit to 1985, we see that Harvard cardiologist Bernard Lohn and his Russian collaborator, cardiologist and Kremlin physician Yevgeny Chazov won the Nobel Peace Prize for founding and leading the NGO International Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War. Upon hearing the news, former New Zealand Prime Minister David Lang remarked, the IPP and W made medical reality a part of political reality. Now, historians and epidemiologists, of course, would argue that medicine and politics have never been distinct. I've suggested today that there's a much longer history of cardiologists and cardiovascular researchers who have worked both to advance their own and to promote um, their own research and to promote an international peace building agenda. By collaborating with colleagues from around the globe, Ansel Keys and Paul Dudley White hope to identify the factors that caused heart disease and to improve human health across populations. At the same time, they believe that the scientific relationships they developed would advance their own and American peacekeeping priorities. Through the seven country study, through world congresses, through international training seminars and foreign exchanges in the 1950s and 60s, 
These medical specialists encourage their foreign colleagues to pursue cardiovascular disease research to defeat a common enemy. In so doing, they share their skills, their technologies, and their techniques to build a new empire of the heart. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Connor, for flipping those slides. And I am happy to entertain your questions. Yeah, thanks so much for a very interesting talk, Sarah. And if um, if people would just put their questions either in the chat window or in the Q&A window, um, I can field them from there and then pass them on to the speaker. Well, while we wait to see what people come up with in the chat, I might start with a question of my own. And that is, um, given that uh, I was really fascinated by the Health for Peace movement and this bigger uh, chronological moment you describe of a kind of high point for uh, US Soviet health diplomacy and, and also more robustly international health diplomacy at a pretty hot moment of the Cold War. And I was thinking about all of the other international health programs you mentioned from malaria and polio prevention. Um, I also think about examples that aren't about health specifically, but that are also international science, like the International Geophysical Year was obviously an outcome of this process. So um, was Keyes involved in any of these other international health programs during the Cold War? Because it seems like he had his hands in so many things. He had his hands in a lot of pots. Um, but uh, he was not, he was, he was really, you know, he testified before Congress in 1959, um, as did White, um, basically saying, yes, we need a new NIH Institute to um, pursue um, uh, the support of international research. This is a, a profitable way um, uh, to work uh, and uh, we, we, we don't have the money basically, but these, these acts of fighting disease are ones that everyone can embrace uh, it, it, regardless of their politics. Um, but his interest was really um, limited at this point to pursuing heart disease epidemiology. And um, I wish I could say he had been involved in some of the other projects that you, you mentioned. Um, he was involved with the UN until about 1955 on the Expert Committee of Nutrition. Um, he uh, participated in all of these ISC or International Society of Cardiology um, uh, programs, whether they were world congresses or um, international training seminars. Um, and, uh, you know, but his, his interests were heart disease at that point. Um, he, he didn't become involved with other uh, research workers uh, who were part of the International Geophysical Year or uh, the Green Revolution or, or a whole bunch of other projects, major projects. Well, thank you. We, we have a couple of questions come in um, through the chat. The first one says, for Key's writings on diet, does he make the distinction between processed and unprocessed food? And if so, how does he handle the subject of bread, for example? Ah, yeah, um, he does. Um, he handles it by giving recipes for making your own bread in his cookbooks. Um, uh, and, you know, it, it, that he wrote with his wife, who was a biochemist, Margaret uh, Haney Keys. Um, uh, but uh, he he handles it by the first, uh, his his really internationally best-selling cookbook, Eat Well and Stay Well, comes out in 1959. And the first 100 pages of that cookbook um, look at uh, the, the data on nutrition and heart health, basically. And they are an introduction uh, to, uh, to that topic. And he includes uh, processed versus unprocessed foods. And he encourages people to avoid highly processed foods um, and to cook simply, uh, to make uh, uh, certain substitutions, to uh, enjoy fresh fruit instead of um, 
you know, uh, apple Danish, have an apple. Uh, in fact, eat, eat as they do in the Western um, uh, nations that he studies that are part of uh, the, the Mediterranean region. Um, it's, it's really interesting because Keys in many ways um, defines the Mediterranean diet. Look, there, there are 20 countries plus uh, around the Mediterranean, right? We have North Africa, we have the Middle East, we have Europe, um, uh, but Keys uh, defines the Mediterranean diet in a specific way uh, that looks at Western Europe and he's biased in, in this way, um, but, uh, but he does uh, you, know, you know, he has uh, a whole list of things that he says uh, 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 people should do. Um, and this is his, this is his best-selling cookbook. Um, and, uh, you know, one of them is basically to eat whole foods uh, and cook for yourself, which a lot more people were doing back in the 1950s. Um, even though we saw the rise of highly processed foods um, uh, in that time after the after the war and after Keyes himself has worked on the K ration, an incredibly highly processed food, um, uh, you know, he's, he's championing whole foods, um, basically what we would call whole foods today. All right, thanks. We have a, we have a number of other questions that have come through um, while we've been talking about these previous ones. Um, the first one asks, do you think the Cold War was good for nutrition and health advances in the US? <laughs> Um, I, I, I wouldn't go that far. Um, I, I would say it was not good, <laughs> necessarily good. I mean, think about space food sticks, think about Tang, um, uh, uh, you know, processing, uh, the, the food processing industry or uh, food processing within the food industry really gets going in World War II. Um, the, the Second World War is the greatest boon to food processing ever because they have to figure out how to make foods that will ship around the world to troops that are in every location uh, and will survive extremes of temperature uh, and duration. Um, and so uh, food technologists, uh, it's a boon for food technologists, those who are processing and inventing new processes uh, for food. Um, the, that continues in, during the Cold War. Um, it's not what Keyes is advocating um, uh, after we're having worked on the K ration, but it continues uh, during the, the Cold War and uh, we get increased, uh, uh, pro increasingly processed foods. And in fact, um, you know, this is what Keyes is, is writing about. You shouldn't be eating these. Uh, they're, they're not good for you and they're particularly bad for your health. Although he is, um, you know, and especially processed fats. I mean, he comes out strongly against um, uh, hydrogenated, uh, partially hydrogenated vegetable oil, trans fats. Um, not in the first book, but in the the second edition of the first book, he's converted, and he realizes that these are bad for your health. So, uh, the Cold War, it's this period of time was not good for the American diet, um, but. Um, Keys was not uh, certainly was not championing the highly processed foods that were so abundant uh, and grew even more abundant during this time. Great, we have one other question about diet that's a nice follow up, and that is, um, although it would have been toward the end of Keys's life, did he ever comment on any of the fad diets that started to pop up in the later twentieth century? <laughs> oh yes, um, yeah, he he certainly. Did. Um, and uh, he was not a champion of any fad diets. Uh, um, and he referred to them in very uncomplimentary terms um, within his cookbooks that uh, he could not get away with today, in fact. Um, he, uh, and um, so it, Keyes uh, really was championing a very simple, Mediterranean diet, uh, and not necessarily all the vegetables you would have in the Mediterranean, because those were hard to come by. If you think about the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, it's really not until the past 20 years that we have, you know, blueberries uh, every month of the year available to us, right? Um, uh, so eating was more seasonal, but he's he's advocating a seasonal style of eating that involves lots of vegetables, lots of fruits, 
um, uh, lots of nuts, green leafy vegetables, especially uh, uh, dairy and um, low fat dairy and uh, sources of protein such as fish, chicken uh, that are preferable for him uh, to red meat. Um, so he's, he's basically taking elements of the Mediterranean eating style and um, advocating, advocating those. All right, thank you. Changing gears a little bit, um, we have a question about the seven country study. So given that that study is still going on today, how or to what degree did the dissolution of Yugoslavia change the methods of the study or the scope of the study? And are all the current nations participating? Yeah, and that, that's a great question. Stay tuned. Um, I, I have to finish writing this chapter and I, I have to look into that. But I will tell you that the seven country study and the follow up uh, continued into the 90s on the majority of participants. Um, and so, uh, you know, 40 years later, they were, they were still uh, following up. Right now, I identified those people in Greece. Um, they are the only remaining living subjects within the seven countries study. And they're beginning to do a variety of new tests on them to look at, you know, um, at uh, their genetics uh, to, to see if there's something else uh, a foot that accounts for their uh, incredible longevity. Um, of course, there's also the field of epigenetics. So it may be in part the diet that they've been eating, the lifestyle they've been living. Um, but those, those people who remain are incredibly savvy and uh, about their health. And what's so interesting to me when I went there and interviewed them a number of years ago, uh, they were still talking about the study, talking about their participation, and it had led to them keeping really current. And they had a very, they were, many of these older people were tending their gardens. That was their physical exercise now. They were tending their gardens during the day and they realized that the vegetables that they grew were very different from the vegetables that had been designed for their transportability uh, and shipped around the world for, um, uh, you know, thousands of miles and, and weeks uh, uh, that, that really uh, they were talking to me about what they were doing to preserve the health. So what you see is the, that while this, the training in cardiology may have uh, empowered uh, local uh, physicians in these areas, the people who actually participated in the study became, you know, started to watch their diet much more and become conversant in nutrition in a way that I certainly had not anticipated. Great. Um, following up on that last question is another question in the chat that asks, did the, the dissolution of the USSR affect any of these international uh, medical cooperation? Yeah, the Lacey uh, Zerubin uh, uh, document or exchanges uh, end uh, and they're renegotiated um, in the 80s and renegotiated in the 90s. So the Lacey Zerubin years are about 15 years, I think, uh, uh, and uh, longer than the 10 years that I showed you in this particular uh, talk. Um, but those negotiations are changing. And of course, it's much easier today to go between, with, with the exception of the pandemic, uh, to go between these nations, um, uh, between Russia. Um, and of course, you know, the dissolution of the Soviet Union um, and the splitting up as, as your, the previous question indicated, um, uh, changed things to a certain degree, the politics, uh, the visas uh, necessary to do this work, but there were researchers on the ground who trained subsequent generations of researchers and the internet uh, um, made it possible to you know, communicate at least uh, data uh, among researchers uh, in the late 90s and uh, 2000s. All right, well, we just have a few minutes left. If anyone has any further questions, um, please post them to the chat and we'll get to them. A 
And if there aren't any questions right away, um, I'd like to give you, Sarah, a chance to wrap up if there's any final comments that you'd like to, uh, you'd like to add. Yeah, sure. Um, I would just say that, um, you know, uh, it, it's, it's very interesting to me that um, they built uh, you know, they built this incredible infrastructure of support through private monies, through private organization uh, in, in this period. And there are now tens of thousands of people who go to world congresses in, in cardiology. Um, I find, um, you know, I find their efforts um, just really extraordinary. It was not easy traveling in the 1950s. Um, they were traveling on, you know, propeller planes across the ocean. Sometimes they were taking boats. Uh, they, um, their equipment, uh, they had, they had to have uh, protective uh, boxing for their equipment. Uh, the roads were not good in these rural areas uh, that had been pockmarked by war as well. Um, uh, it, it, it's just, it's really a fascinating episode in uh, the power of perseverance and global vision. Um, and it's also a really symbiotic relationship that um, I think that uh, Keyes and White developed uh, so that um, White is, is really gung-ho about uh, spreading um, global goodwill and creating an international community of cardiologists, and Keyes capitalizes on that. Um, he could never have, have, I think, pursued with the degree of success that he pursued the seven countries study without Paul Dudley White's help. Um, and, um, and, and Keyes gave White a certain scientific cachet as well um, uh, because he was a, a, a sort of avuncular fellow, you know, White was fascinating. He was, he, he recommended exercise and you, you can go to Boston today and see the Paul Dudley White bike trail because, uh, Paul Dudley White was very active in leading, uh, the, um, what is it? The um, American wheelman, uh, and speaking to the American wheelman about bicycling as a wonderful form of lifelong exercise. So White had his uh, fingers in lots of pots as well. Um, um, but uh, I, I'm just really impressed by the degree to which they built uh, uh, an international cardiovascular research community um, with largely through private monies um, during this time. That's a great way to wrap up. Um, we, we, while you were speaking, we have one final question that Connor posted, which is um, an interesting and specific one. What did Keyes think about the so-called food pyramid? Oh, that's a great question. Yeah. Um, well, uh, he, he uh, you know, appreciated any uh, part of nutritional advice and you know, that, that he wanted to teach people how to eat well, right? That's why he wrote his cookbooks. But um, the, I, he, was not, um, he was not a great fan of the food pyramid because he felt that it, it was not specific enough advocating you know, whole grains or portion sizes, uh, a whole host of, of, there were a whole host of problems with it. But what's interesting is his collaborators get a hold of the US um, uh, that his collaborators in Italy, at least, get a hold of the U.S. food pyramid, and they say this is terrible. We can't believe that people are using the food pyramid. Uh, we need to come up with uh, a better uh, a, a better image for to teach people. And so they they develop the the food temple, the Greek temple or or the Roman temple. And so they create a with different pillars of different whole foods and. Uh, so the, the iconography of uh, good nutrition is something uh, that, that is really wonderful, and you could write a paper about that. Um, and uh, so, uh, it, you know, Keyes was a critic of this, and yet Keyes's research on um, dietary fat uh, also influenced uh, the creation of the, the food, first food pyramid. Um, and the McGovern Committee in 1977's uh, first dietary guidelines for Americans. 
um, were influenced by Key's views on diet, the role of dietary fat, especially saturated fat. Um, and heart disease. They were also uh, influenced um, by lobbying groups from the food industry. So it's an uh, interesting story. The great, great question. Well, that, that wraps up our time for today. I want to thank our speaker for a fabulous talk. I want to thank Connor for his tech support and everyone in the audience for attending and for your great questions. Thanks a lot for being here. Thank you. I appreciate it.